Travis, how you doing, man? Boom, baby. Here we are. In Texas. Yeah. Nice to have you here. Hey. Uh, I uh, I phoned uh, Parker Lewis when I got here, and he first said, he said, you're free again. Yeah. You're free. Yeah. Good to have you here. Land, land of the Bitcoin miners now. I know, man. It's wild here, right? Yeah. How long have how long you been here now? Uh, permanently about four months. Uh, my girlfriend and I started spending time here, kind of doing Airbnbs back and forth between here and L.A., kind of last spring and found a place and i'm from tech my, my i grew up two hours north of here my family's still up there so it's it's nice to be back in texas and are you mixing with the bitcoiners here some yeah some honestly i've been in a hole working nonstop. it's been it's been uh as you know a lot lot going on lately so um been trying to get out and yeah and do some stuff um the the, uh, the unchained capital guys got a good thing going yeah do you know you know parker yeah yeah because they've got um, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff for uh, South by as well, I think. Because mm. South by won't touch Bitcoin, right? Fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it here, man. Yeah, Texans, um, Texans will touch Bitcoin for sure. Uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's uh, and it's interesting meeting some of the. I've met some of the oil and gas people down at the Houston meetup, and they're like, they're in. Yeah, that was my whole career before crypto. Was it? Oh, yeah. you were trading. Yeah. Was it oil futures? No, uh, equities. Equities. Yeah, long, short energy equities and like non-control private equity and debt in the energy space. What's, but, the, what's that like for them at the moment? Yeah, you know, I hadn't kept up with the guys nearly as much. I mean, it's it's uh, it was brutal for years and then now it's obviously been going the other way and, and um, I hadn't kept up with them too much. But All right, man. Well, listen, look, I always like getting you on the show. You know that. Um, a couple of years ago, there would like there was two people we would get on who would tell us a, a similar thing. It was you and Caitlin Long. Mm -hmm. You would both be talking about like what's happening in the markets. It can't carry on forever. There's too much debt. Like, this quantitative easing can't go on forever. And we were getting to the point where we were like, oh, we need to talk about this. And uh, because some of the people were saying, well, COVID was the pin that was going to break the bubble, but like it didn't really. But like what's happening now, this last kind of week, two weeks, this might actually be the pin that pricks the bubble. Maybe. Um, I, I, that type of stuff is always hard, hard to call, hard yeah. to predict. And then even I think when you're in the moment, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to know. I, I think certainly some of the occurrences that have happened over the last month have woken people up to the need for – censorship resistant money for sure and um just decentralization in general i've just been i just feel like there's been a lot of billboards over the last month about why decentralization matters yeah and it's a lot of that ties back to bitcoin you know i think some of the deplatforming stuff is kind of less relevant to bitcoin but still firmly in the in the category of of, of why decentralization matters um and and how slippery of a slope that can be and and free speech. What, what does free speech mean in a, in a in a social media world, right? I think you you've been seeing a lot of that stuff, like with the with with the Rogan stuff, and 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 even going back to, you know, uh, the pre uh, Donald Trump is not on Twitter. Uh, the president of Ukraine, ha I'm sorry, the president of Russia has a Twitter account. Yep, and that's like just an interesting thing that we we got going on right now. Yeah. Um, and, and that points to another interesting thing because the the work we've been doing over the last uh, couple of months has been super interesting. Towards the end of COVID, it all got a little bit samey, a little bit boring. And uh, But what's been going on now, like some of the conversations we've been having are really super interesting. It doesn't matter who you speak to. You could speak to an ANCAP. You can speak to somebody who's like a Bitcoiner, but maybe they are, you know, they're not a libertarian. Maybe they're a Republican even we've had some people on the show are kind of like lefties as well. Um, and what we've we found is like it doesn't matter where you are on this political spectrum, political, apolitical, there are like certain truths that everyone is seeing at the same time. Yeah. There are certain things where everyone's kind of like pointing in the same direction. And actually, even outside of that. So we did this interview with Mark Moss talking about cycles, talking about all the various cycles, economic cycles, political cycles. And then I was uh, listening to the new Ray Dalio book. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's talking about the similar things. There's like these, these truths that keep coming forward that a lot of people are attaching to. 
And I think it all points back to what you're saying here, this kind of like this need now, this absolute need for decentralization. Yeah. And, and in a world where technology, humans reliance on technology is, is sort of unequivocally going to increase. And that, that, that trend looks inexorable in, in that world, you got to start looking more closely at the entities that wield the power via technology. And it's just a, on, you know, whether you're on the left, whether you're on the right, whether you're a Bitcoin fan, whether you're, whether you're not, um, you can, I think, pretty objectively look at the state of, of, uh, of big tech currently and say, is, is the centralization of technology causing societal problems? Yes or no? If humanity is going to rely more on technology in the future than they are today, what is the likelihood that those problems could potentially be exacerbated from the levels that they are currently? And that, that's a setup that uh, I think people with all sort of leanings or whatever can just look at that and go, yeah, that looks like a potential issue. And do you think that centralization of power within technology companies is an issue just in isolation or is an issue alongside this kind of like creeping authoritarianism within what a what a you know western liberal democracies uh an example great example i mean uh, you mentioned it in your email which we read this week um anyone listening by the way sign up to the ikigai email we'll let you pitch that at the end because uh, it's a great email um but a great example being what happened in canada yeah you know, a lot of people made donations by by gofundme yeah a lot of people did those in good faith, believing that money would get to these truckers. GoFundMe were fine with it until the government came into them and said, right. hey, we're not having this. And they kind of prevented it. Right. And then we went to a point where people were making Bitcoin donations. And then even the guy collecting the Bitcoin donations, you know, he got a visit from the police and the, right. the private keys were owned for part of that Bitcoin as well. So is it in isolation? Is it together? Is it both? Oh, man. Um uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure how how I think about it. I, I think the the it, when you look at trends like AI, robotics, um, you know some of the other some of the other you know you know biggest trends that are that are coming in in technology, and how much power Google has right now. Well, whoever is like in the lead for robotics and AI, that's more power than Google has right now. And maybe that ends up being Google. And that's, that's I think, on, on the big tech side. And on, on the government side, looking at, uh, l l looking at just how things that felt like they would never happen seem to be happening with a higher frequency, a higher occurrence. Can you give me examples? The GoFundMe is, I mean, that, that, that's a great example. Um, and the Canadian government, which you think of that as like a developed nation, like it's like if that was happening in, you know, I don't know, whatever. Tur Russia. Yeah, <laughs> Turkey or like, you know. Brazil. Venezuela or, 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 or something like that. Um, I think people would pay less attention to it. But you think of Can Canada as being you know, kind of like the United States, there, there was a point that I saw brought up that, that really drove it home for me, which was if what, what, they, what they did with the GoFundMe, well, if I tried to raise a GoFundMe to fight the government about what they had just done to shut down the Ontario truckers GoFundMe, would that GoFundMe also get shut down so that you don't have the ability to fund, the people can't fund uh, uh, pushing back against the government. And that just gets so slippery, slow, so fast. And we need, we need things like this to bubble up to the, to the top of the collective consciousness. Like they have, you know, it's front page news everywhere. It's, uh, it's all you see on social media for a few days. And it, it requires that bubbling up to get, uh, people to kind of lift their head out, out of whatever it is they're doing. People are busy. People got all kinds of stuff going on. Oh, it, it's really just crypto people that, that, that have this, this natural tendency to think so much about the way the government is infringing on 
on rights or big big t- the centralization of big tech is 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 infringing on on people's rights like crypto people we just have a tendency to be like that most people are just living their life doing their thing but when something like this pops up then it it, it acts as a forcing function for more of society to say oh we need an alternative what are what are the alternatives and then they start looking elsewhere and i think just as importantly as that you know some of the solutions uh you know bitcoin's an, an amazing solution for the money side of things for some of the big te- big tech side of things uh you know I, I, I in my opinion you know i don't think bitcoin can can solve some of that and maybe nothing that exists right now in its current incantation in the crypto ecosystem you know layer one smart contract platforms or whatever dapps m- m- maybe those can't solve that uh that centralized authority of big tech problem which means you're going to need developers the people that are actually going to build the shit you need them their attention to be caught as well too and y- you need it to be egregious enough that they're willing to stop doing whatever their giga brains are doing right whatever smart thing they're building in regular life to be like you know what i actually think building something in a decentralized uh you, you know in, in this path is a, is a worthwhile thing We'll come back to that because I do want to talk about that because whilst it's a Bitcoin show, I have got like an evolving opinion on this. And, you know, that thing in your email, you said some of this stuff can't be built on Bitcoin. You know, me and Danny made us like sit back and question and think about it. But I, I do want to touch on that trucker thing that, that I think is kind of interesting in that trying to, we, we covered it on our show. We had Greg Foss and um, What's his name? Cut nothing caribou. Yeah. Yeah. Caribou. We had them on to talk about it. And Nobody caribou. Nobody caribou. Yeah. And, you know, I was like fully supportive. I made a donation. I thought this was bullshit. But I also realized sometimes we get stuck in our own echo chamber, whether it's on social media or making the show. We got a bunch of emails from Bitcoiners afterwards on that show who were like, listen, there is an alternative view on this. Like I support the truckers, 100%. I support their right to protest. But there were specific examples. One guy whose uh, his mother or father had their operation canceled because they couldn't get to the hospital. Mm. People couldn't get, get their kids to school. Now, I flipped to the other side and I said, well, look, civil disobedience has to create some difficulty for people. But I don't think the trucker issue, I, didn't th- I don't think a lot of people saw that as an issue outside of our cohort, actually. Right. I think some people did, and there's like some louder voices, Jordan Peterson's and such, who did. But I don't think enough did. And what that made me realize is like, okay, some people did. We got a few more people. Russian billionaires having their assets stolen. Again, we can discuss and debate whether that's right or wrong. That's another group of people. Like there's a group of elites now who realize they're at risk. There are people who are just in Russia being deplatformed. There's a whole list of people who are now being given these use cases for censorship resistance and decentralization. And what it feels like to me is we're getting in a flood of things in once. You know, a few years ago it was, oh, I can buy weed on the internet. Cool, mm-hmm. that's a use case. WikiLeaks can't get payment rails. That's a use case. But you'd get like one every year or two. Right. We're getting all of them in one go right now. Yep. Yeah, it's um I I, I had not thought deeply about I guess like the negative aspects of civil disobedience, what you just said makes, makes sense. Um, I think universally getting, uh, support to affected Ukrainians, like that's kind of universally positive. And you had the crypto ecosystem that raised like 50 million bucks in a week Unreal. And, and, and got it into people's hands. Um, and, and, uh, that definitely made it to the global stage as well too. And, and, um, it's like I said, you just, you, you need those things to act as, as a forcing function for, you know, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And, uh, people aren't going to pay attention to that, uh, unless it's right there in their face, I think. And I, I thought the same thing about, uh, like the GameStop, uh, Robin Hood, uh, Wall Street bets, you know, change the rules kind of thing to keep Robin Hood, uh, Wall Street bets people from like everything that happened with Citadel Securities, that whole thing back in whatever, January, February of, of, of last year. 
And, and that was one of these things that bubbled up to the top of the collective consciousness because it was like the little guy was winning at the big guy's game and then the big guy like changed the rules right when it was when the big guy was getting beat worse, uh, the worst in order to, uh, you know, not have the little guy win anymore. Remind people listening what happened, just because there'll be some new people who won't know the full story. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was there was a huge short squeeze on on GameStop stock, and uh, Robinhood changed. You know, the stock was 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 skyrocketing higher day after day after day, and Robinhood like changed the collateral requirements, the margin requirements, and basically shut down the ability to. Uh, buy any more GameStop and said that it was under this guise of like margin requirement type of stuff. Um, but it so obviously looked like big Wall Street hedge funds that were getting run over by the little guy in Wall Street bets collectively and then changed the rules so they'd stop getting run over. Protecting the big guy against the little guy. Yeah. This is why the Russian thing's interesting uh, with what's happening with the oligarchs essentially having, you know, being subject to asset freezes right now. I, I saw about that $600 million, $800 million. <laughs> Fuck knows how much it's worth. But the super yacht that's just been, mm -hmm. um, the German authorities have just taken, I mean, mm -hmm. just taken. And people can debate whether that's right or wrong, whether that's, you know, because he's an oligarch and the relationship with Putin, whether that's, you know, uh, like a mafia right. boss, uh, you know, whether you're just like a, a necessary asset freeze in like this war game at the moment. But, Outside of that is historically all we've seen is the little guy getting squeezed in all these situations. The little guy getting fucked, whether it's the truckers or the GameStop people. It's always the little guy, but now we're seeing some big guys get fucked. Right. And I think that's raising this idea that anybody, if you literally said it in your email, you know, your ethnic group or your, I can't remember your exact words, but. Someone will. Someone may come after you. Everyone's at threat, and every, I think everyone needs to realize everyone's at threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your social class, your social or class, or yeah. your your ethnic group, and that's what I mean. Like it's that's it, it's just a slippery slope like that. And and I think you. I don't know. I guess I try and use a compass of something like like an inalienable right, like just a you know a sort of like God. If you believe in a God, a God given right. If you you know, or just natural law or however you, however you want to frame it. But it, it, you know, is, is, is free speech an inalienable right? And what does that mean in the context of social media platforms that are owned by corporations? Is uncensorable money an inalienable right? Um, I'm, you know, I just, the, the invention of Bitcoin was a total step change in the technology of money. Money, in some ways, is just a technology. And uh, within the, the backdrop of, of these current events that have been going on, um, that, that type of question and the implications for, for, for that, um, people are starting to see that a little bit more clearly. Because like, yeah, maybe everything, everybody thinks that, that Russian oligarchs um, uh, should have their their stuff sanctioned and and you know I think I, I generally probably agree with that um, but then the next thing you know well you know what about truckers that are protesting against the vaccine um, against the vaccine mandate well that feels a little bit more shaky and then you can you, you can look at the history books and it's it's easy to see that like as you start eroding these things the next thing you know it's it's your ethnic group. It's your social class. It's your. It's the people you care about, um, and the things that seemed impossible all of a sudden, you know, seem a lot more likely. That makes me think of something else as well. I, I've brought it up previously, whereby you're. Sim I think you're a few years younger than me, but similar age in that we've kind of lived through this really steady, kind of stable period of three, four decades, whereby it feels like the the big events of history, you know, the big wars, the, the big changes in society is kind of like we've missed it all. It's all all in the history books. But we're now going through this like period of time now where like history is being rewritten. And I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen, Travis, over this next year, decade. But we could come out at the end of it like in a very different world. 
Yeah, I don't know if I'd, I'd, I don't know if I'd agree with everything happened before our time. Because I'm on about like the big events of like world wars and yeah, but 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 the the erosion of trust of centralized authorities that didn't look the same in the '90s as it looks right now, and you can look at polls um, over long periods of time, and you, and and you can see that. And it's, I, I thought about how, how that started. Like, wh where did that, what started society beginning to feel that centralized authorities were failing the people at an increasing rate? And um, I think about, um, and, and, and part of it is that in the information age, you can catch people that are full of shit, that are lying to you. You can just catch them better, yep. right? It used to be, you know, catching Nixon back in Watergate, but you know, that took all kinds of 1970s stuff to have that, ha have that happen. And a stroke of luck. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but in, in the information age, it just gets easier to, to put some of the pieces together about how full of shit or how not in your best interests, centralized authorities have been acting. And, 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 and I think a lot of it started in America with, the reaction to 9-11 and then the, you know, us going over to Iraq, talking about weapons of mass destruction and spending, you know, however many tens of thousands of lives on both sides, $10 trillion over that period of time under this guise of weapons of mass destruction that, that never ended up actually being the case. Well, we knew we were being lied to. Everybody knew they were being lied to. Not at the time. i I felt like we did. Yeah. And then, okay, well then, so you're just sitting, even if that's true, so you're sitting there and the, the government's sitting there lying to you. And then, and then I think the financial crisis was another big step in this where uh, subprime metastasized, you know, almost blew up the globe, kind of blew up the global financial market and like nobody went to jail and all the rich people like stayed rich basically. And people just kind of looked at that, like normal people just kind of looked at that and were like, well, why wasn't anybody held accountable for that? And then if you really start to dig deeper into it, the reaction to the financial crisis in 08 uh, from, a, from a monetary policy perspective has then set us off on this path now that we cannot get off of. And when the next crisis came around in COVID, the monetary policy response was, you know, so massive in this direction of loose monetary policy that you're just going further and further of just driving this train straight off the off the cliff. And we're just going to kind of see what happens, basically. And I just I, I think and maybe it's just me being neck deep in, in crypto stuff all day for years now. But I'm and, and, and that just makes me biased. But I think more and more people are waking up to um, uh, just that general tendency for uh, centralized power to be failing people at multiple levels, whether it's at the government, whether it's at Wall Street, whether it's big tech. Um, and decentralization, distributed ledger technology, uh, is the technological platform to go drive societal change for the good and, it, and I think it's like a, a multi-decade trend. And um, in, in some ways I get, uh, not, I don't know if happy is the right word, but I, I know that we need these things to happen more and more to wake people up more and more to the need for an alternative. You have to have these forcing functions. Otherwise, people are just kind of too placated by, by, by their day-to-day. -day. And I see it more here. This this. I don't know what it's like for Danny because he lives in Australia, but uh, I see it more here than I see it in the UK. I see it in the UK, but it's like a 10x here in the US. Like every problem that we have in the UK is 10x worse. And I don't, I don't know if it's the problem's 10x worse or the left-right divide is making it look 10x worse. Yeah. But it always feels 10x worse here. How, how bad is the divisiveness in the UK relative to the US? <laughs> it's... Right different there aren't battle lines drawn on specific issues yeah. so uh i can give you two examples um so 
we our equivalents to of Republicans and Democrats is Conservative and Labour Party mm -hmm. voters. And I wouldn't say there is a massive divide on vaccines, whether you're Labour or Conservative. My friends, whether they're one or the other, their decision to be vaccinated or to oppose vaccines or vaccine mandates wasn't along that political mm. line. Just, it just wasn't there. There, there. there may be a slight bias towards conservatives being more like Republicans, but it's not as big of an issue. Similar here, I'm now finding a little bit with what's going on in Ukraine and Russia in that there's almost universal condemnation for it. Whereas I'm finding my more conservative slash libertarian friends in the US are a little bit more suspicious about what's happening and why it's happening and why do we care and do we only care because the media is telling us and why don't we care about what's happening in Palestine and in uh, Yemen. Now, I, I think they're I think they're wrong in that. I think people do care, but uh, but we don't have that divide. What's it like in Australia? Uh, it's probably more similar to UK, I think. And I think actually the like sort of the people who are against oppose like the vaccine and the mandates in maybe the UK and I think Australia actually is more the left wing, like and not like the woke left wing. But like the people that are making a big stand in Australia are like the tradies and the truck. So working like, class. It's the working class mm. people. Yeah. Yeah, so it's very different. So this is where I think I get in trouble, I get into the arguments with people, is that they have this expectation, being a Bitcoiner, that I have very similar views for them. But I'm I'm not just a Bitcoiner, I'm British. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very influenced culturally by how we are in the UK. I, I, I think the problems are exactly the same. But like I say, it just feels worse here. It almost feels like you're leading the race for the fracturing of everything that's happening. You know, we don't have a, we have a crap prime minister. Well, <laughs> on the spectrum of political leaders, actually, he's not the worst. You know, he opened up the UK for COVID before everyone else. You know, again, we don't need to get into the debate of what's right or wrong. You know, he was, you know, he did champion that. Yes, he shouldn't have been having his cheese and wine parties. Everybody I know was having their own private cheese and wine parties anyway. But we don't, you know, he's of a he's of a reasonable age to be a leader of a country. He's not eighty years old. Yeah. Um, we don't have people like Nancy Pelosi. We don't have all these things where we keep hearing about uh, politicians um, benefiting from their investments in you know the stock market, yeah. being able to be privy to certain information. I feel like the U.S. is just fracturing ahead of us. Yeah. We're on a similar trajectory. We're just behind. And I think that's because we have this. One of the reasons I think is that we don't have two party politics. We have four or five parties of which we have two main parties, but we have that kind of release valve. If you can't pick one side, there is like one or two other parties you can vote for. Yeah. So I think that's one of the other differences we have. The, I mean, the two party system in America, I don't know. It just feels like it's never been more fragile yeah. than it is right now. I just don't think it works. And, and, in a digital age, in, the, in an information age, where you you can be defined, you can pick whatever group you want to be a part of. That's a global group, right? And you can be much closer to. I can I can have a much closer relationship with some guy I've never met in person before. That's in Asia somewhere, relative to my next door neighbor. That you know, like physically next door neighbor. And the tendency for the information age to to I think make people sort of define themselves who they are by this much broader thing makes it even harder to shoehorn into like this two-party system and young people i think just feel that like a lot more acutely than older people and and i i, I it seems like so many more young people just recognize that like both sides are full of shit mm -hmm. both both sides are full of shit equally full of shit in different ways and um eventually you know boomers are gonna you know golly they're holding on to this power and money like just you know our our, our politicians are so old in america and they're just holding on to that power and that money and you're gonna have to pry it from their cold dead hands and a, a lot of the change that i'm i'm hopeful can be pushed through in in coming decades it, it is going to be partially predicated on just enough time passing that enough of the younger generation is in in positions of influence and 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 financial 
positions that like some of these changes can actually can actually happen. And and I think the the really optimistic view of that would be that there's like an inevitability to that. Yeah. Uh, and is there like fundamental changes to the political structure or is it just a change to the people who represent right. the constituents? Um, the ongoing debate I have with libertarians that's having it today online today is that I think the ideology is great. I just don't think it works. Yeah. I think on paper it's perfect. I agree with everything you're saying. I just, I don't think it, I don't know how you get there from where we are now. Right. It's too big a leap. Right. Um, but it's, which is why I always say I wish more libertarians were involved in politics to maybe have that release valve to pull on the size of the state rather than pulling left to right, pulling big to small. It's quite interesting, this guy, Josh Mandel, you know, he's a guy who's potentially one of those people who can make a difference because he's a Bitcoiner. He believes in small government. And that, that kind of person could, you know, if you had enough of those type of people, they could make things more interesting because... I still don't know how you decentralize politics. I know, I mean, yes, I do. I know you can smoke, uh, focus on a, a more local level, but I don't, I don't know if you can achieve a real like decentralized form of governance where there's no real power structures. I think you always have them. Well, if, you're already seeing a little bit of this with, with, um, with the crypto ecosystem as a whole, but if, if the crypto ecosystem continues to, to grow in, in, in prominence and, and frankly market cap value, like I think we all think it's going to, um, then very quickly crypto is going to be like on the ballot, so to speak, like in a meaningful way, maybe not, not literally, but like you're going to have, you're going to have politicians that are going to have to have stances on this. You're already starting to see that. And, and there are some amount of crypto people that are willing to be single issue voters. And you could get into a situation where, um, you know, it's a tight, whatever, it's some tight contested race, con congressional race, senatorial race, whatever. And neither party or neither candidate has come out with any sort of view on crypto. And you might be able to get, pick up some single digit percent um, uh, vote swing by just coming out and being supportive of, of crypto uh, because crypto people are that... Uh, fired up about this well it's a growing hack as well you yeah know, if you when you declare yourself as a bitcoiner or even a crypto person you suddenly you suddenly gain this whole bunch of followers or people are interested in support yeah support you uh nobody gave a fuck about el salvador maybe certainly two years ago maybe even a year ago probably couldn't even point to it on a map right they didn't know who bikali is now everyone knows who yep. he is and everyone in bitcoin or crypto loves him he speaks the right language. He's he's clearly been influenced by them as well. And I think a lot of politicians start to see that. We've had it. Danny, how many people, how many Senate uh, people? Like who politicians. Are, yeah. At least five reach out probably. In the last, what, three weeks? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. People are running like in, yeah. racing, uh, in a race for like a seat in the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, we've already had a couple on. We're, we're just rejecting them now because every interview is the same. Yeah. But I get why they want it. Because they want access to that audience. Yeah, that that's an incentive structure that you just love. Like yeah. that's just a shift in. I mean, that, that matters. You you run that that incentive setup out a few years, and like you can get shit changed based on that. It's going to take a little while. It's going to happen overnight. But you know, you get into the back part of this decade, and um, that 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 just starts to look a lot more promising. Flip it the other way. Here in Texas, imagine imagine. One of the people running, you know, well, excuse my use of language because I don't know the exact terminology, but running for the Senate or running for Congress here and being anti Bitcoin. Yeah, that's Texas, probably not going to go over very well. It's not going to work. Yeah. There's too many jobs here now. Yeah. too many people here. Like, I think this state has flipped. I think this is a certainly a Bitcoin state. Yep. So it's flipped. But I think others are realizing the hack. The, and the game theory points in one direction that's only. Right. Yeah, which is nice. Because what is it? 30% 30, 30 of the U.S. population owns some form of crypto. Is yeah, that correct? I think that's right. I think that's right. That, 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 that new study just came out a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Let's um. So let's talk about this crypto stuff because it's kind of interesting. Uh, me and Danny were talking about it earlier. I've been debating a bit recently because this show's a Bitcoin show, right? That's what I focus on. Uh, arguably a Bitcoin maxi, but not like entirely. I see that just see them as different things. 
Um, <clears throat> and that's why your email is interesting because I see Bitcoin as separating money and state, right? It's decentralized money. I don't, I see crypto slightly differently. And my evol- this kind of position I'm evolving, evolving to is that aside from the platform stability, you know, questions which we can, uh, can be a separate debate or the future of these platforms, like you rightly said, the technology might not have even been invented yet. But this idea of uh, companies that are more uh, operate like decentralized platforms that have a uh, more decentralized power structure, more decentralized ownership, that is something actually I can totally get behind. I don't know if it's workable, I don't know how it's built, I don't know what platforms, but the idea that perhaps you can build a Twitter where the power is decentralized so you can't censor people, Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah. And the ownership, again, is decentralized or the benefits of that are decentralized. That's something I, I can get behind. It's, it's where these people argue, it's like, oh, we've got a better Bitcoin because it's faster, it's lower transactions. That's the shit I can't, I can't be bothered with. Yeah. But that idea of these kind of new forms of decentralized company I don't, I, it's not even whether or not I can get behind it. It's happening. Yeah. It's when can one of these companies, or is it possible for these technologies and companies to, to get the network effect? That's what I'm not sure about. I'm not sure if a decentralized Twitter can get the network effect of a centralized Twitter. Right. If it doesn't have, like, how does it have the money? Or how, how does it have the, you know, I, I've run companies. Uh, the idea of running a, a company decentralized doesn't work. Like for the football club, for example, people have said to me, "Oh, you should decentralize decision making." No, I'm running this. I'm I'm running this like, an, uh, like an authoritarian. I don't need <laughs> everybody to vote on every decision. Can we build these companies in a, in a more decentralized way? Is it possible? I mean, you can hope for it. You can see the benefits of it happening, but. But can it be done? Yeah. I'm, th- th- these two questions I've been asking for years, what do you need decentralization for and how decentralized is decentralized enough? Yeah. And we still don't have firm answers um, to that uh, for these various different use cases. But I think going back to, to the early part of this conversation, when you imagine the immense power that is going to be uh, wielded by technology companies as we move through this decade and into the next decade, and we got a, autonomous driving cars and machines are taking more and more people's jobs. We're spending more and more time in in metaverses. We're, uh, you know, some you know AI, AI is just like running more and more of our life, right? Like you, you've got like some Siri, you got to write an email, and like you've got some Siri that you talk to, and you're like, hey, I need to write an email about this, and like the the AI just like takes a crack at the email for you and see how how it shakes out, like that kind of thing. Oh, you read it, you're like, ah, oh, it's a little. You need to change that. Like all of that's coming, and the corporations, you know, you know, if corporations end up being in control of that publicly traded, profit driven, just that kind of thing, you you look at the problems that we're having right now with big tech companies, and you go, well, how big are those problems going to get? And that in that type of situation, and I just really believe, and and, and I'm not going to pretend like I know exactly how it's going to play out. I just really believe that a decentralized approach has a higher likelihood of not exacerbating the problems that we're seeing already with technology. That that just that just seems to make sense to me. Um, and that doesn't mean that there there aren't other problems. And like, you know, the problems that we're seeing with like wealth concentration, with wealth inequality, like I don't necessarily know if the crypto is going to solve those. Um, but I think it's got a way better chance than the way the system works right now uh, and the sort of like crony capitalism and like rotten democracy that we find ourselves in today in America. Um, kind of the exact things that the founding fathers were warning about a couple hundred years ago. And um, Have you seen the Boeing documentary? But No. It's on Netflix. Um, Boeing the planes? Yeah. You know the issue they had with the 737 MAX? In the MCAS system. The two Only planes. vaguely, but yeah. Okay, so uh, interestingly, I decided to watch this documentary while on a flight. <laughs> Which <laughs> might not be the best idea. I yeah. would advise everyone to do it. Um, but uh, what happened is Boeing, um, one of the, you know, they were like the, the gold standard for safety with aircraft. Amazing track record. Uh, and they released this new plane, the 737 MAX, 
and back, I think it's like October 29th, 2019, Daniel Check, uh, Lion Air, which is, um, I think, an Indonesian airline, 737 MAX, crashed. It's like, oh, shit, this happened. You know, yeah, it was in the news and kind of kind of died away from the public consciousness. And then, like, a year later, or no, even six months later, an Ethiopian Airways 737 MAX crashed. Mm. And so the stuff came out in the news, What like, you know, there was a problem with this system called the MCAS, which is basically a stabilizer. This documentary went into why this happened. It's fucking unbelievable, but it, it comes back to your point about what happens when there's profit-driven incentives. Mm -hmm. So what happened was um, they, they dug into what happened was Boeing merged with or they bought McDonnell Douglas, and then McDonnell Douglas people uh, started changing the way that Boeing was run. And then they started to become slaves to Wall Street. How do we become more efficient? How do we make more money? Which meant less people working on quality control to the point where like there was this one point this lady said, we used to have 14 people in a, in a warehouse on the production line. We had one. Hmm. And they found a ladder still inside the plane that was for, like completed on construction. You know, th things like that. And so what happened with the 737 MAX, they were getting their ass kicked by Airbus. Airbus released the, I think it's the A350. And so... The quickest way to have a new plane is to reuse a current plane. Mm. So they just cut all these corners. They use a current plane, bigger engines are more efficient, but because they can redesign the mainframe, they had to like uh, lift them higher because of the way they they designed it. The plane might stall because it would go too steep. So they had this automated new MCAS system which would level it. But what they didn't want to do was train any pilots. They didn't because if you had to train pilots, there was a bit cost, so they didn't. So these pilots were flying with new technology they didn't know they had, and this led to these two crashes. Yeah, that was the unintended consequences of it. Profit, profit-driven incentives, and Wall Street leads to cutting corners, leads leads to bad outcomes. Yeah, where, where can decentralization as a technology s s alleviate? Uh, uh, incentive structures that are not in the best interest of the people that like just as a fundamental question. And, uh, I think it's, it's, you can sit there and think about Bitcoin and you can go open source software code is a better, uh, it's better to have that in charge of money than a bunch of old white people sitting in a back room somewhere that have all kinds of allegiances and are former bankers and are like, like that's just a, a better, that's a better way to work around potential conflicts of interest. And it, you can almost think about it from the perspective of like, if aliens came down to earth and they have, they're an advanced civilization and they have the benefit of hindsight and they know the role of technology and they look at it and, and you can just go, objectively, does it make sense to, rem humans have this tendency to do these things uh, and, and are, 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 are fundamentally self-motivating type of people. And when you put them inside of an incentive structure like corporate profits, they're just over time, even, they don't even have to be bad, it's not that they're bad people. You just, you get into this incentive structure and people just kind of end up doing what they're incentivized to do. It can be lots of little yeah, bad decisions. Yeah, and, and yeah, that's right. Uh, like, that's like how everything works. And, and, and I think about the, 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 the echo chambers that social media create through uh, the, how the algorithms work. And, and, you know, Facebook was just trying to get people to be on Facebook more and so they could have more advertising dollars. And the next thing you know, the algorithm is built in a way that is causing divisiveness that has, you know, this country, uh, you know, as torn apart as it's been in a lot of cases in, 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 in decades, in decades. I, I mean, I think about the Black Lives Matter protests and the, the, the riots in, in Los Angeles when I was there. And, I, and I, I, was, I was sitting there and helicopters flying all over the place and and people getting shot, you know, not far from where I lived, and 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 there's just a lot, a lot of divisiveness. And social media echo chambers were a meaningful driver of that. In the context of of, of corporate profit driven uh, motivations, and 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 it's one of the reasons why I think DAOs, which are just we're just scratching the surface on what that's going to do, and um, but just something something as simple as like you know, trying to buy the, 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 the copy of the constitution or whatever. And, and the innovation that's happening on the Dow side, you run that out over the course of this decade and into the next, and you really 
can imagine a situation where a lot of the natural uh, uh, incentive structure driven problems that you can have can be alleviated in, in, in this, this decentralization that is made possible by technology that we have not had for very long. The, the thing I then think about, uh, which by the way, uh, the guy in the Bowen documentary said, he said, when there's a plane crash, it's not usually because of one thing. It's a whole series of little things that lead up to that one bad event. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for whatever reason it is. But this is where I have this real difficulty discussing th these ideas with um, people who've got more libertarian ideas. Because the the human greed or the human uh the human problem isn't always considered enough for me i'm going to keep talking about this bowen one just because it feels relevant but the faa are there as a centralized body to protect uh you and i from the the, the manufacturers of the planes and the pilots you know, from making these decisions that screw with us they have their process of recording and analyzing every crash they have their processes of um of, or regulations for you know construction of planes yada yada in a fully decentralized world without any centralized governance i think you lose things like this mm. because how do you how do you build in that structure and i don't i, I think th so i i see this future whereby we have a combination of we start to understand what things should be decentralized and what things yeah. should be centralized. Yeah. There's also this really great book I read recently called The Fifth Risk, which is all about the transition from uh, Obama to Trump and all the things that the Trump administration weren't ready for. And it just talks about all the things that government does that probably won't get done if you don't have a centralized authority. So like, that's the area I'm most interested in. When people talk about liberty, it's like, well, but let's talk about what we lose and the risks of those side of things. I think about this a lot. Yeah. I, I'm not an anti-regulation guy. Um, I think you just have to be, you have to be clear eyed about how tainted that process can get mm -hmm. and how the people that are in charge of the regulating, uh, those are humans with, with networks of people and allegiances and jobs they had before that. And maybe jobs they want after that. And, uh, you got to be clear-eyed about that. Big questions, man. Okay, listen. Going back, just because you uh, spend a lot of day, a lot of your day looking at the charts and in the charts, going back to where we are at the moment, um, and thinking specifically about a country has been cancelled. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, a lot of a lot of it I disagree with. I saw yesterday some film festival has pulled the Russian films from it, which I think is wrong. And I think there's a dog show that's banned dog, Russian dogs now. <laughs> so I, I think the, the, the cultural banning's gone a bit too far. I'm on the fence on the sanctions to oligarchs. I, if I, I know if I say I support it, there are people listening and going to say, well, you're supporting people coming after your money. I think these people are essentially a mafia. So I think it's slightly different, but, but there are people who are really going to suffer at the hands yeah. of this counseling, especially in in Russia, yeah, uh, we see uh, Jerome Powell come out. Was it yesterday and said, or two days ago and said there may be more than one reserve currency. We have the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. It's certainly losing its position. It's not lost yet. We have Bitcoin growing as a position. We're certainly. I don't know what uh, the U. Uh, sorry, Russia and China, China going to trade in, but it's not going to be dollars, right? Because they can't. We had Iran come out today say they're going to be taking their oil debts in the euro. Like we've got this radically changing world. How much are you thinking about this? C certainly paying attention to it. Um, that stuff definitely takes time. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think uh, that it's the sort of thing that you just snap your fingers and and things you know, change, change meaningfully, uh, uh, overnight. But, uh, I've, I've always thought not always, sorry for the last, you know, 18 months ish, uh, the investment case for Bitcoin as pristine collateral 
has been how I've generally been framing it and thinking about it. And the dollar is the world reserve currency. And then when people use that term, they mean that like uh, a, a lot of commerce and 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 contracts are based in dollars. You know, if 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 Brazil is selling bananas to France, they price the contract in dollars. But but the you know we the the global financial system is a debt based financial system, uh, certainly, and treasuries are the collateral foundation of the global financial system and their current market cap is you know the aggregate value of all the treasuries in the world right now is probably 25 trillion or something like that and the number is definitely heading higher and you look at um and 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 the the interest rates on treasuries set the interest rate for every other thing on the planet when you look at the sort of outlook for treasuries as a financial instrument over this decade and the next that looks challenged and so people do start to look for, well, what else could there be out there? And that list is, is like surprisingly short. Like the world does not want to use Remimbi as the, or, or Chinese sovereign debt as the collateral foundation for the global financial system. The Euro, that's a joke. The Yen, that's a joke. Gold, I, I mean, I don't know. And it, like the, the, it's it's hard to find things that can make any credible sort of case. Why 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 is the euro a joke? Why is the renminbi a joke? Like someone I don't understand because like I just see them as just smaller currencies than the dollar. So the the euro is in worse shape from a like unsustainability perspective than the dollar is, and you don't have to look any further than however many trillions of negative yielding sovereign debt there are in the European Union, uh, and and how broadly. Uh, how wide of a dispersion there is in the European Union of different uh, countries that contribute different things and having one currency trying to govern all that and then to have that be, uh, or to have the debt of that central bank be the collateral foundation, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the renminbi, I, I just think a, a, a command economy like China's, like a, a, a communist country like that, the world's just gonna have zero interest in having that, uh, that be the collateral, the debt of that be the collateral foundation. And, and, and so I think when, when you look at Bitcoin, it honestly looks like the next best option. And if, if Bitcoin, uh, the thing that I'm looking for over this decade from a in, investment case perspective for Bitcoin is just, is it making slow progress towards being pristine collateral? Is it more widely available to be used like that? Is it getting integrated into the pipes of the, of the global financial system more and more? Is there a very liquid, well-established borrow lending market for fiat currencies based on Bitcoin? Tick, tick, tick. Yeah, and, you're, and, 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 and that's why when I see like, like NYDIG raise, whether they raise like $700 million or something like that. I didn't see a, this. A few, a, this is not that long, a few months ago. Damn. Their last funder is like $700 million. Well, I'm pretty sure they're gonna spend $700 million trying to get the pieces in place for Bitcoin to go be pristine collateral. And that's not something, again, that's gonna, that's gonna play out this year or the next. That's just a broad direction over the course of this decade that you may get to the end of the 2020s and Bitcoin has started shipping away market share at, at treasuries. And that's how you get, you know, 5 trillion market cap, 10 trillion market cap and, and, and beyond. What's stopping it at the moment? Is there anything specifically that's holding back? And like it, as a reserve asset, does it need to be more stable? Or is that not too important? Um, I think the stability will come as it inevitably grows in size. Right. Um, I think it's just too new and too wacky and the, the decision makers are too old too many of the decision makers are too old and too unwilling to um, uh, seriously consider it. And, um, but I think all of that is, is, is solvable and will, will get solved over the course of this decade. Do, do, you think it's, uh, do you think the hands will be forced on it anyway? I've talked about this before in that, I don't know about you, but I'm essentially, but Bitcoin's my reserve asset. Now. Mm -hmm. It's certainly for funding the podcast, you know, keep the majority of the money in Bitcoin. Personally, majority of money in Bitcoin. That now influences my decisions quite a bit. Yep. Not small day-to-day -day ticket items, but you know, buying a house. I've just bought a new house. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, how I purchased that house was influenced by 
my ideas around Bitcoin. Right. The loan I would take, the length of the loan, how much the loan was, yada, yada. So it, I'm essentially there and nobody can stop me. Nobody makes me or takes that decision away from me. It's the same for Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy. It may be the same for you. It may be the same for Danny. It's certainly the same for uh, Bukele and El Salvador. This growing list of people who can do it without somebody centrally having to make that decision, like in design, being decentralized, it's it's becoming this global reserve asset by the decentralized decision making of people who choose to make that decision yeah. rather than is that how it happens? You're like eventually you're forced to because everybody else is. Uh, I don't know. I don't know to be honest with you. I mean, I think that it is, it is an idea that. Uh, is captivating enough to catch people's attention and bitcoin has put itself into a position where it's it is increasingly i think beating society over the head with its value proposition and back to the first part of this conversation it's why you need actions like what we've seen recently to act as that forcing function and then the next thing you know somebody's asking me about hey what's you know some normies asking me about hey what's this whole bitcoin thing and the idea just just spreads like that. So four and a half years ago, when you were, or five years ago, where you were trading long shorts, we, we've had this conversation a few times. You're like, you saw this Bitcoin thing as this once in a generation opportunity. You must be pretty, feel pretty vindicated for that decision. Yeah, you know, I was worried about, I, I thought, I, I don't know, I'm not even sure where this came from. I thought... I had like distrust of institutions like at a very early age so that by the time I was 18 years old, I thought both political parties were full of shit and I just was generally distrustful of institutions. And um, I was not somebody over the first, you know, 10 years of my career, I did not spend a lot of time thinking deeply about the future broadly. Like I think about, oh, I'm going to get married, I'm going to have kids, where I want to live, what I want my career to be, like that sort of thing. But like, say for example, the, the role of technological evolution as it relates to society. Like that was just not something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Now that I've been neck deep in crypto for years, you do spend a lot of time thinking about that. Because if you own if you own Bitcoin, yeah, it's a good one year bet, three year bet, five year bet. In some ways, it's also like a twenty year bet, right? It's a it's a fifty year bet in a lot of ways. And so if you <laughs> if you own a lot of something that's like a twenty year bet or a fifty year bet, you start thinking a lot about twenty years from now, fifty years from now, technology, th these sorts of things. And, and and it has been just been a ton of that kind of thought that has that has me thinking. Like, like looking at the current state of, 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 of the role of technology and, 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 and how it interrelates with society and how ripe it is for change. And uh, it gives me a lot of hope that it really feels like younger people feel that more strongly than older people. So that like Zoomers are going to feel that more acutely than, than millennials and whatever past Zoomers are going to feel that even, even more. And and I just think that when you look across the whole landscape of potential uh, solutions, that decentralization uh, as a as a meaningful part of it, not 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 everything's going to be decentralized. Your point about running your football club that's not that's not what I'm trying to say. But just having it as a an integral part of the way that technology is going to be interrelated with with humanity in the decades to come. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I just think that that looks like a, a, a really great way to approach it. All right, man. Well, listen, I've got one, one thing left to talk to you about. It's the metaverse. Mm. Uh, talked about it a little bit. Dovetails uh, into a lot of this, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's something that I think is like super exciting and freaks me the fuck out. It can be the best and worst of everything we have going on right now. Uh, depending on who controls it, who owns it, who manipulates it what it ends up being. You can totally game it out. Uh, Sci-fi films always tend to predict the future pretty yeah. well. Uh, I'm not sure how far we are away from Skynet, but... Um, it's Ready Player One. It looks like it's shockingly accurate. Yeah, Ready Player One looks 
pretty accurate but does ready player one become the matrix that's what i don't know right <laughs> uh you like you explain to some people that think you're a psycho but you can game it out how it can happen uh, uh i also worry about some of like the behavioral changes that might happen a bit like when facebook first arrived mm -hmm. it was just fucking fun mm -hmm. throwing sheep at each other and poking people <laughs> uh and now it's just this hoax wow the po forgot Re about the poke? hoax shout outs pokes the poke's still there <laughs> Really? The poke, yeah, it's hidden. You have to go into their profile and then you click on the drop down. You can still poke. I, I poke the occasional friend. <laughs> <laughs> the occasional poke. I'm a bit old for poking these Peter, days. Peter, don't poke me, please. I'm not going to poke you. <laughs> I'm not going to poke you. Um, but yeah, that, like, it was fun, right? It was like this new thing. And, and now it's not fun. It's like fucking hell. Um, and could could the very early metaverse be fun? Like... Uh, some people, like I did this uh, interview with American Hoddle and Jun Seth, and we were talking about it, and they're basically saying, like, there is no metaverse. It's really just, v you know, VR. But, like, I see it as, like, connecting parts of VR together. Mm -hmm. But looking at, like, what the early metaverse could be, for example, I've got my Oculus Rift here. Have you got an Oculus? No, I've yeah. used it before. But been, yeah. Have you been on the Walk the Plank thing? Yeah. Fuck. I know. Can you jump off the end? It's legit. Uh, sure. I can't. <laughs> but uh, my favorite thing, and there's the boxing game, right? Yeah. And that was built by one dude this boxing game but like it's pretty real like yeah. you're moving around you're throwing your punches afterwards i'm fucking wrecked uh and to start to think like you can immerse yourself in worlds like that okay that's cool well can i can i pick up a guitar and play for metallica at wembley stadium yeah you probably can like those unreal experiences but like i start to think about this is all the fun bit but when does it go beyond fun yeah there's already th like uh you know, in these virtual worlds, people complain about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Do kids become addicted to it? Does normal does it become like a drug because like normal life is so fucking horrible that people want to be in the metaverse all the time? Like, these are all the things on my mind. Yeah. Well, I think I think the gaming side of it is is one thing to think about, um, and just existing or commerce of various sorts is kind of another way to think about it. Um, or not another aspect of it. And part of my, so, so the, the, the journey for me personally was when Axie Infinity really took off. Um, and we weren't involved early there, but when it, when it really, really blew up in, in kind of May of this year, we started digging into it to kind of understand what was going on and understand, you know, you know, play to earn the, the scholarship concept. And I've got no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, so there's there's this crypto project called Axie Infinity, yeah, and it's a, a real basic game. Like think of it comparable to like one of those old Facebook games you used right, to farm okay. Farmville or, or whatever. And the in game mechanics are such that like you can have an asset, and the asset you can do you're like a you know an NFT or whatever uh, an in game asset, and you can breed it. You can breed these axes, um, and then you can make money. You can make. Uh, uh, you can generate tokens by doing that. And what ended up happening was uh, Axie owners, people that owned a lot of Axies, would loan the Axies out to people in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian people would do the activities to breed the Axies. Um, and just think of that as like grinding in a video game, right? Like you've heard that term, like, oh, I've got to grind to get to the next level up and blah, blah, blah. And Oh, and they use those time incentives to make you pay to jump the clock. No, 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 no. it wasn't that. It was that they just would loan out these axes to people in Southeast Asia. They would do the grinding work of breeding the axes, and they would get a portion of the profits that were generated by that. And that's play to earn. That's the concept of, of, of play to earn. And they call that lending of the asset, they call that scholarships, basically. And um, what you were seeing was uh, Axie breeders, scholarship recipients that were earning a living wage in uh, Southeast Asia because the speculative speculators like me uh, the, the, the wealth gap between the speculators and uh, uh, people in Southeast Asia and developing countries was so wide that you could peel off what amounted to a living wage for somebody. And uh, 
it ended up kind of being a bubble and, and the price has, has come down a lot. It remains to be seen kind of kind of how that story is going to shake out. But when I when I finally understood like like what had done enough research to understand what was going on there, that is going to be we're at the earliest stages in in what is going to be an enormous uh, trend for that. And it's part of what gives me such high conviction that it is going to be such a big deal is my conviction that over the coming decades, machines are going to take more and more humans' jobs in the real world. And, uh, you know, we're going to have autonomous driving cars soon, and you're going to have, uh, you know, who, how much longer do we need accountants, right? Like, at what point are computers doing all accounting? And you just think about uh, all kinds of different jobs that over a couple decade period of time, machines are, gonna, are, are going to take more and more people's jobs. It's part of the reason why I think uh, universal basic income is an inevitability. And, and, and it's not bad because it's, it's technological, technological innovation driven abundance. Um, but what you end up doing is like, what is humanity going to do all day? They're going to have universal basic income that's going to give them, um, you know, roof over their head, food, um, uh, you know, a, an okay lifestyle. You're going to have a phone. You're going to have Wi-Fi. Um, but then what do you literally what do you do all day? And what's going to happen is, uh, I think, is that all of these new worlds are going to be created digitally and you're just going to totally reimagine the concept of work. And in these new worlds, you're going to have, you know, the physics can be different than the real world. The economic incentives are different than the real world. The governance is different than the real world. It, you're just creating entirely new realms. And then people are going to be, uh, you know, the, you're going to be, uh, you know, trying to coordinate and incentivize groups of people in this world to do different things. Does that sound familiar? It's kind of like the real world, mm. right? And as I've been going further down this rabbit hole, I, I, and I, I consider myself a Christian and practicing Christian, but the, the, the more I, I feel like uh, I'm convinced that we're in a simulation, the more research I do on this, the more I'm convinced <clears throat> that this is a simulation. We're in a simulation right now. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. Obviously, I don't know for sure. Well, but I, the I more the I do this, because, because the way to think about it is, the way to think about it is, okay, it's 2022. Let's run this out a couple hundred years, which in the history of this earth is a blink of an eye, a couple hundred years. You're telling me that in a couple hundred years, you can't have a non-playable character inside of a game that you have coded in some sense of self to that non-playable character inside of that game such that that character sort of like realizes that it's in this world kind of thing, which is sort of like a soul, the way that I think about it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, so I'm a character somebody's playing. No, uh, no, that's not. No, that's not, I would like better skins. I would like to be <laughs> fu fucking as tall as you. Picks me up as a short, fat British guy. No, and, it, and don't get me wrong. I mean, this conversation gets really weird really quick, go, right? Go weird, man. Uh, but, but it, no, but, but it just, it, it, is, it is something that I, I really have been thinking a lot about. And it seems like we're just at the earliest stages. I, I, this is the top of the first inning of this. Well, like, what percentage chance do you put on us being in a simulation right now? Oh, I don't know. Like, I mean, more than 50%? I mean, I feel like it's been creeping up to, like, closer to 50. Yeah. Like, I understand the theory. It's like, we've gone from, yeah, God, what am I? When I was, like, 14, the first kind of real, like, people had mobile phones. Like, maybe one of your friends did. Mm-hmm to now like everyone's got it and it's like a supercomputer. Right. And you used to play SimCity on your you know, old computers and now they're like, the there's these worlds that my kids play games and they're like unbelievable that spawn out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so like you say, you go forward 200 years can, as a version of Fortnite that you spawn like this infinite world that's already created. Yeah. Get all that. And the other thing too is like I've been listening, I like to do like a quantum physics podcast. Like I listen to Lex Fridman and then like I've like found some other podcasts like through Lex. I like, I like listening to these guys talk. They got these world expert, you know, world-class experts on uh, that are talking about, you know, basically where are we on what do we know about the universe? And the more I hear these guys talk, the more it sounds like a, a player in a video game trying to describe the video game around them. 
and that our understanding of physics is like try, is like the player inside the video game talking about the the way the bits work the way the way bits work inside of 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 the video game like seriously it's a lot to think about there <laughs> next 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 podcast how, how weird does it go like what's the weirdest oh, i mean i think it's just going to be fast i mean in our lifetimes it's i mean it's i think it's just going to be fascinating and I, and i think the the digital world is going to continue to eat the analog world uh -huh. and how dystopian or not that ends up being will be entirely a function of the individuals that are working towards one eventual outcome or the other, which is what makes doing this type of work to me so worth doing. I think we're very lucky as well to be, well, I, sometimes I think we live through the best of times, but also sometimes I think, well, maybe it's not the best of times. Maybe, maybe the seventies would have been a lot better. <laughs> well, listen, we can- M Music was a lot better. I'll give you that. Yeah. Definitely a lot better. Music's been shit since about I think I think about the nineties was the end of good music. Not too far. Yeah. Uh we can do we can get to the weird metaverse afterwards. You can have to send me some podcasts I need to listen to. I will. Tell me some ones to check out. Um I've talked about your email a few times in this, Travis. Uh it's brilliant. Tell people where to go and subscribe to it. Yeah, it's e ikigai.fund, I-K-I-G-A-I.fund. You can sign up for it. It goes out the first of every month. And you can read all of the historical ones. I've been written, writing this thing for like three and a half years now. 42 of them? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, man, always like talking to you. Thanks for coming on. And we should try and get a beer in this next couple of weeks. Yeah, man. We'll do it soon. Thanks all for right. having me. Cheers. Bye.